thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you like what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. And today we're welcoming... Incredible authors Brian Andrews and Jeffrey Wilson to the show. Uh, together, they have wrote some incredible series of books. Uh, Tier One, Sons of Valor, The Shepherds. Uh, obviously, the new Shepherds book, Dark Intercept here. And the incredible Rogue Asset, uh, after they started working with the W.E.B. Griffin Estate. Um, gentlemen, it's great to uh, have you on the show today. Good to be here, man. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. And so... I'll, two kind of stories here. When it, the pandemic hit, I was never really big into reading before that. Um, now, as a kid, I would read all the Goosebumps, uh, Boxcar Children, stuff like that, where it's like, I don't care what the subject matter is, I'm going to read about it. And as I got older, you would go to college and read the books that you had to read. Grapes of Wrath, Animal Farm, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, Things Fall Apart, stuff like that, where you're kind of like, I get it, but I'm not really enjoying it. And then as I get older through college, I would read, I read every Stephen King book. So every 12 months to 18 months, I know I'm going to read a Stephen King book. Um, but I never really enjoyed reading outside of that. So the pandemic hit, and uh, like most people, I sit at home and I'm kind of like, man, what am I going to do? There's only so much fitness you can do. There's only so much movies you can watch and I'm <laughs> TV. And so... I basically just started reading again. And what kind of came of it was there's so many good authors out there that I kind of neglected over the years. And so playing catch up with people like yourselves or Jack Carr, uh, it was it's surreal. Because growing up, you're like, oh, Clive Costa has got a new book. Um, or uh, whoever someone else over here is, or uh, Tom Clancy has got 30 new books coming. And so audio thing is crazy and so i never really appreciated what authors are doing today and so for you guys to kind of come to my peripheral um, i know you guys did a bunch of stuff with jason piccolo a good friend on his podcast and i was like man i gotta start reading these books because clearly they're having an effect on people so again thank you gentlemen for kind of reaffirming my actual love of reading it just <laughs> took 35 years to finally get there yeah so sorry college that ruined it for you I i'll tell you <laughs> You actually found the perfect time, John, to jump back in because I think, and I'm speaking as a reader here, and I think, and I know Brian, and I've talked about this all the time, so I know he agrees with me. There's never been a more exciting time to read, to be a reader of thrillers because, you know, with your background, you can appreciate this. There's never been such an influx of people who have been there and done that writing in this space well, you know whether you're talking about jack or you're talking about josh hood or you're talking about mark cameron who was you know with the marshals i mean there's so many people don bentley was an apache pilot and then an fbi agent and they're bringing this authenticity and voice to the genre that was never there before and so i i have a hard time keeping up with the reading because there's just too many people out there to keep up with and of course ryan and i have like four books a year to write so it makes it even tougher but um so you 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 coming back in at the perfect time i would say and i think too you know it's it is a um it's not uncommon as people you know after college you're starting your career you're very busy maybe you're trying to start a family have young kids and you know reading i think is the first thing that people take off their plate you know it's like I'd love to read, but I've got all these little fires I got to put out. And I think the pandemic for a lot of people, hey, you know what? A lot of this stuff I used to run around doing errands or whatever, I'm going to I'm gonna consolidate that into one trip a weekend or have my food delivered or whatever. And I think people have found some time to put back into their life, you know, these some of these things that, that, that were missing, that they, had, that they had taken off their plate, fitness being one of them, but I think reading is another one. And uh, so I love to hear that, you know, you had some time, the pandemic sucks, but the fact that you were able to bring that thing back into your life is pretty cool. It's a cultural yeah. thing. Remember that you remember the movie Madeline with Danny yes. DeVito and he says, why would you read a book when there's a perfectly good television right there? <laughs> and then you get back into reading and you're like, oh man, it's a whole different universe when you do it in, in a book. 
And it's funny too because my dad, he was never into reading either. And obviously, it, when he re- is he recovering from different medical issues and stuff, and obviously with the pandemic, he went down this whole rabbit hole of just reading all these books from the Bill O'Reilly series to all your stuff. But unbeknownst to me, I didn't know he already read Rogue Asset or Dark Intercept. And so with my podcast, but hey, Dad, I'm having this guest on. He goes, Oh, yeah, Chip McCoy and Jedediah. I'm like, What? Uh, I'm like, That's and- cool. But I was like, here I am with not knowing, I'm technically, not technically, in a book club with my dad. The neighbor across the street who served in Vietnam is huge into reading. So him and my dad will trade books. And I'm just like, again, it is so fascinating that in this time of the pandemic, people can kind of come together even closer and just talk about certain characters or stories. And again, uh, it is a really fascinating time. I think you should have had your dad on the show, you know, because he's he could contribute to this conversation. <laughs> yeah, it, it is fascinating too because he because so, we're all, I'm always like, yeah, how do you read a book so quickly? Because I can't, especially if it's come to Stephen King or like the fantasy stuff, which I, I love because it's it's not real, I guess, and I can just plow through a Terry Brooks book. Uh, but when it comes to this stuff, um, I was never in the military. Per se. I went to military college, and so I have a ton of friends in the military. But when it comes to like the tactical or the security or executive protection type stuff, I'm very well in two because I've lived part of that life. And so it, I always kind of take slower to read that because I'm like, well, this doesn't make sense. Like, or when you watch a movie like White House Down or Angels Fall, and you're like, man, what? Like, I love it for the Hollywood aspect of it, but this is not really going to happen. And so when it comes to reading books like Dark Intercept or uh, or uh, Rogue Asset with Chip McCoy, you're kind of like, this is a guy who can kind of get behind it. So again, it's just, I just love the fact that characters are created in this day and age that resonate with people. Um, and so I guess my first question for you guys, obviously, Brian, submarine officer, Jeffrey, combat surgeon, both Navy veterans. Could you write a character like Chip McCoy um, or any of the other characters from the Shepard series or Tier 1 or Sons of Valor had you not had your career in the military? Or does your actual mm-hmm. background experiences help help kind of you guys put together these stories? I mean, absolutely, for sure. Could we do it? Um, you know, I've been writing my whole life. I like to think I could do it, but there's no way I, I could do it or we could do it even as a team as well as we do because these characters truly have over time become amalgams of people, men and women that we have both served with, people that we are connected to in the community, whether it's in Secret Service, you know, we've got some friends over there, or FBI or, you know, the other government agencies, and of course the military. Those people and those relationships so inform how these characters grow. I, I think that one of the reasons we become known for these very realistic characters and very realistic relationships is that it's it's easier to write something that you're intimate with and know about and and uh, we can't give away any secrets but there are people in our lives in these books that recognize themselves and always with their permission of course so could we do it yeah will we do it as well i can't imagine that we could do it as well what do you think brian <laughs> I, have la- I have to laugh. I have to laugh because amazing writer. Well, I have to laugh because I was the guy that was stuck underwater in that little <laughs> black tube, right? Like, so without Jeff, I, I couldn't write about any of these people. He was the badass that was with Naval Special Warfare. I was just slinking around underwater. So there's no way in hell that I could write any of these stories without Jeff. Um, now I could fake it, but it, <laughs> I'd be selling five copies a year. So I think what's nice about our partnership is that we really do bring together um, these different elements of our of our professional experience and our strengths and weaknesses and stuff. And yeah, I mean, I think um, I think just sort of nails it when he says, you know, there's elements of different people that we've served with in lots of these characters. And I think that's one of the reasons that they are so relatable, because even if you haven't served, you can still be like, yeah, you know what? Dan Munn reminds me of so-and-so, you know, everybody knows a guy like so-and-so. Um, and so we, we work really hard to, to do that. And I think it's one of our strengths as a co-author team. As it, in the military life, obviously you guys do a lot of report writing chits and medical forms and everything you guys deal with. But as you transition out of the military, is that, 
is writing something that's always been on your mind? Like, how do you guys kind of go into the real, the real world, the civilian world uh, with like, is, are you, was there any fear where you're like, what if I'm not a good writer? Like, how do you kind of beat that, like that block, that mental blocking to kind of push yourself out there like you are today? I mean, I think we both have slightly different stories about that. I mean, um, and I won't, I won't tell Jess, but my story is that, you know, I wasn't writing stories, um, but I always was sort of a storyteller. So like in the submarine community, you know, we are sneaking around and there's long periods of time where the, the boats drive around at five knots rigged for quiet and you're doing your mission. But in the engine room, you know, nobody's doing it. The bell's not changing. Nothing is changing in the engine room. And so you might have a six hour watch and how do you pass the time? And, you know, the way that we would pass the time is we'd tell stories. And so, you know, I would tell my own stories. And when I ran out of my stories, I'd, when I'd get into port and I'd hear stories from other friends that were on other boats, I'd co-op their stories. And I'd, we'd go back out to sea and I'd be like, all right, guys, I got a whole bunch of new stories, you know, shit that happened to people, funny stuff. And so that was just part of the way that we interacted, kept ourselves sane. And in that oral storytelling tradition just became sort of a part of my personality. And it wasn't until I was leaving that, you know, somebody was like, hey, dude, you know, you're a pretty good storyteller. Have you ever thought about writing a book? And I hadn't actually thought about it, but he put that earworm in my brain. And then, you know, as time went on, I thought, you know, maybe I should try. I, I saw an article that sort of generated this what if question. And I started my first book and it, it took me eight years to write that book. Um, but it wasn't until I met Jeff and, and got involved in the thrill writing community that like, you know, that passion that, oh, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can write books faster. Maybe this can actually be a career sort of took over. Yeah. The, the, you know, you, you asked about the, con I think your, your initial question was about like confidence, right? Obviously we, um, we get that through Brian's unadulterated arrogance, but um, no, I'm, I'm joking, of course, but I think that it's, it's a good question on the craft side of this business. And, you know, we are blessed now with the opportunity to mentor a lot of young and upcoming writers. Some are all, already very successful. Um, and that's one of the things we tell them is you can't allow, like any other job, you can't allow your lack of confidence to paralyze your ability to perform. So if you're going to this task and saying, well, I just don't know if I'm good enough. Well, Maybe you're not, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. But at some point you just need to tell your story. What takes a story and turns it into a publishable novel is hours and hours of rewrites and edits. And that's the, you know, that's the mundane part of, of writing. But if you have a story to tell, you have to have the confidence. If you found it interesting, someone's gonna find it interesting, get the story out. Um, but it's a, it's a legitimate question, John. There's a lot of writers with really good talent and really good stories who never really get it out there because they're afraid or they're, Oh, what if people don't like it? You got to just put that aside. I think. When you guys first started working together or writing together, was there any, how weird was it to be both writers to kind of become like this hive mind to kind of focus on this one central story? Is it a weird, like what is some stuff where you say, Brian, you're having a bad day mentally, you can't focus or Andrew vice versa do you have to pick up the other person to kind of accomplish what your goals are for the day? Or you have a timeline with your uh, uh, agency, literary agency to, Hey, we need this book in eight months or whatever. Uh, you, you're going to have a couple of days or maybe even a week or so where you guys can't focus. Like how do you pick up the slack for one another and vice versa? Yeah. And that's a great question. I'll tell you that that is related to um, our background. I think that one of the things that we brought into this at the very beginning, first of all, you asked if it was weird. Yes, it's weird. It's it's weird to write with another writer. It was so weird as a concept that I didn't think we could do it. When Brian first posed the question, you want to try to co-author something? I actually said no. But once we started doing it, I will tell you, it was so easy and so natural uh, and so much more enjoyable. You know, writing is a lonely business, but having a guy, especially someone who's your best friend that you're doing it with and you're on the phone and you're brainstorming together, there's no writer's block. It's a joy. But I think it's the um, it's that military mission before self, team before self ethos that you develop, whether it's in the military or in, you know, federal law enforcement or, or any of these types of fields. When you are when that becomes part of your DNA it makes it very easy. So are there days when, you know, I 
I can't do it. Something comes up. I'm ill. I, Brian had an operation a year ago uh, for a medical problem. I had a total hip replacement for a chronic injury. I had these things wow. side, side rail you, right? Or your kids, you've got something you got to do for your kids. I had to take 48th graders to DC last week. And, and so when you're a team though, you in, you're in communication with your, with your team and, and you say, look, I'm not available this day. And they pick up and they step it up or something comes in, we're in the middle of writing a new book and edits come in from the book before. And so we get together, okay, you peel off and do the first week and a half, two week pass of edits. I'll keep pushing this book forward, then we'll swap. And so I think that would be difficult for some people to be able to you know, rise and fall, push and pull. But for people with our background, I think it's just natural. It's about getting the work done, about getting the mission done. Uh, and so there's never anybody accounting for, you know, I worked 30 minutes longer than you did yesterday. He probably, he might think that. I, 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 I might start doing that now that you mentioned it. <laughs> and, he, and you probably did work at least 30 minutes longer than I did. <laughs> I, probably, I probably worked 30 minutes longer and was less productive. <laughs> With all the, whether it's tier one, Sons of Valor, or the Shepherd series, obviously it's three different worlds you're crafting. Is it sometimes difficult to navigate through each one without bringing in the baggage of a certain character or a plot device into another one? Like, how do you guys make it seem like these are three different series of books, which they are? Because sometimes you see these authors that, I'm not going to name any names, but it's like they have four different series going. It seems like it's, it's just the same character in every series with a different album cover or a different book cover. And so, but how are you guys able to masterfully kind of navigate without bringing the baggage of other books or series into a new book? I mean, that's a great question. And I think for us, we've talked about this a lot, actually, um, just between us. And there are some times where you're like, you know, thinking about one, like Jeff said, we might have a book in edits while we're trying to work on the rough draft of one. And so it's sometimes hard to pull your brain maybe out of one story because you're you're lingering or you're, you're, you really invest in that character. But I don't have any trouble mixing up the stories or the characters and, and sort of, and, and Jeff doesn't either. And the reason why is because we both, both sort of approach this with the idea of like, these are like people that we know. So just like you wouldn't mix up like your best friend from middle school with your college roommate, you'd never mix them up. They're just two different people, you know, and sort of the way that they are, their mannerisms, you wouldn't confuse them. And, and that's the sort of how it is for us. Like once John Dempsey came into existence, he, he sort of exists like, and, and I think for non-writers, this might sound a little weird or like it's, it's just a line or something, but no, like for us, these people sort of exist in real life. They're, they're in our minds, they're people. Yeah, they only are on the pages, but um, they're always gonna act consistently for themselves because that's just who they are. It does sound weird, right? It sounds like something you say on a, on a podcast interview, but um, as creepy as it sounds, it's not just that we know them, they inform us. Like as mm -hmm. weird as that sounds, You'll be writing and you can hear JD saying, dude, I would never do that. I wouldn't do that. And you're like, oh, sorry, John. And you go back <laughs> and you fix it. I mean, these characters have become so real that they exist in our minds and they inform us. And uh, we sort of know what they would do and how they would act and what their arc would be. Um, so, yeah, I agree with what Brian said. It's it's not really a, been a problem. Um, I recently. Not yet. I recently went back and uh, my uncle was big into the Tom Clancy stuff, Splinter Cell, all that. And I recently went back and picked up a book. God, this is probably from the early 90s when he was like still prolifically just throwing out insane stuff. And the writing of the book scared me because, or not, I don't know if that's the right word, but it's intimidating because if you're not into, and I've held a firearm and stuff for the majority of my life, and I can tell you about guns and stuff like that, or tactical driving, all this stuff, but I'm not, I'm never a tactical person per se. Like I'm not here telling you about the nomenclature of my gun or the, my boots. So, like I'm not that guy. And so when I picked up that Tom Clancy book, talk a chapter about a specific bullet or a specific tactic for so long. It's so specific. It's very intimidating to people in that world. And I think obviously the guy was in his, his estate is still an incredible and never to take away from him. But for me, to someone who's lived a part of that world, I didn't really enjoy the books. 
But when I pick up one of your books, there is a equal balance of, yes, you get the specific tactical, the trade, you know what this person is coming from, but there's a human aspect in there that is easily relatable to anyone that might not even have, have read a book like this before. And I think there's something to that. You guys are able to do that. And so with your backgrounds and your trading and all this stuff, obviously you've had other events in your life, whether it's bad relationships or kids being born, good and bad, you brought that human aspect to these characters you've created. And so is that something that when you guys set out to create these characters and continue on with their stories to make sure there's an equal balance between the empathy human side that everyone can relate to versus the, the tactical kick-ass side that I want to dress up like these characters for Halloween. Yeah, it's, it's really fun, John, that you picked up on that because it is something we were highly intentional about from the very first book. And we use Clancy as an example, both of us being huge Clancy fans, reading him growing up. Oh, incredible. But, but, but the readership is different now, right? Like, um, you can't have four action scenes in 500 pages. There's got to be pace. There's got to be action. And we both have always written from a very character-driven standpoint. It's what we like to read. You brought up King. He's the master of character-driven stories. And we wanted to bring that to this genre. But at the same time, you want some authenticity. Um, you know, we like to say that readers love to learn but hate to be taught. So they don't tolerate you explaining to them for four pages, but they love that when they put the book down, they know something that they didn't know. And so what we decided very early on was that we would focus on the character-driven, relationship-driven aspects of the thriller. And we would also provide all of that other cool, high-speed tactical weapons and tactics stuff, but we would do it in context. And I think that's what we do a little different than Clancy. Rather than taking a page of, uh, omniscient narrative to explain how the submarine works or to give this very artificial conversation of two officers who both know how it works. They would never have that conversation so that you can be taught something. What we decided was we would dribble out little bits and pieces of information within the context of the scene from a character's point of view. If he wouldn't think about what caliber his weapon is, we're not going to tell you. If he would think about it, like, oh, yeah, I'm glad I have a 762 because, you know, the 556 is less of a, you know, whatever. If it's, it's appropriate, we'll put it in there. And so that's how we decided to do it. We would make it very contextual. Um, Brian likes to say we want to give the reader that tick on a hound experience where they're not hearing about the team. They feel like they're there with the team. They're, they're that fifth member on that assault uh, breacher team. And so they're seeing it through the eyes of these characters. So that's what we tried to do. We didn't want to cheat the reader out of those experiences, but we didn't want to over explain and teach either. So we just use context and point of view. Yeah, and if you think about Clancy, like, you know, he was given as an author, maybe this, uh, maybe he was one of, the, one of the first where like they took him out on a fast attack summary. He got to do ride along. And he had somebody that went around and showed him, oh, this is the torpedo room, this is Mark 48, he had cap, here's how it works, here's different than you know, other torpedoes, here's how you load it. He got this grand tour, right? Spent time with the sonar operators, learned everything, and he absorbed it and he wanted to share all of that. But like Jeff said, when I showed up on, on the Louisville, nobody was like, let me take you around, Brian. We're gonna to explain to you how everything works. No, it's like, you're here, dude, like get qualified, get smart, get on the watch bill and start contributing. And like, you have to figure it out for yourself. And I love what Jeff said. It's like, no no two officers have this conversation about the inside of the sonar machine, how it works. That's not how it works. They know how it works, right? So we do exactly what he said, which is we try to uh, put you in that character's mind. You're in the position, you have the knowledge, and through context and through them figuring out the problem and solving the problem that they have using the equipment, uh, you learn what it is. And um, so we're, we're unabashedly uh, taking that approach of, hey, we're throwing you in the deep end. You're going to sink or swim with the characters. And some readers are not going to appreciate that. From time to time, we get, you know, a review. They'll be like, I love the book, but, you know, I didn't know what any of these acronyms mean. Well, I didn't know what any of them meant either when I showed up the command. And there's a glossary in the back of the book and you know, you'll figure them out as the book goes along. And if you don't through context, you'll eventually learn, you don't look it up, you'll eventually learn kind of through context what that acronym means, if you, even if you can't figure out the individual words. And I think that uh, based on, if you look at 
the total of our reviews and how the books resonate, I think that approach has been successful. More people appreciate it than don't. So. Well, I love that. And I agree a hundred percent where it's, it's also on the, the reader too, to kind of put two and two together and be aware of the, the seed you're crafting because growing up, I mean, if I didn't know, a word, if I still don't know a word, I have to go to a dictionary and look it up. It's yeah. not the, it's not the author of the, the article, the book's fault that yeah. that's what <laughs> for. And so I, I definitely, I, I totally agree with that. Obviously in these books, the underlying theme is, at the most basic is good versus evil. A hero has to stop a, a plot device of a, a kidnapping or just a vile person. When it comes to, obviously you've created amazing characters, but is it funner for you guys as writers when it comes to creating a new character to come up with a hero or a villain? Or as Jason Piccolo <laughs> says, protagonist or antagonist? Well, I mean... The antagonist drives the story really, right? So this is, I think non-authors might not realize this, but antagonist always is causing the problems, right? And so the protagonist has to react to what the antagonist is doing. So if you don't have a compelling antagonist, it's not as much fun for you as the writer, but it's also not as exciting for the protagonist. The hero's journey, the hero's uh, accomplishments, get diminished by having a weaker antagonist. So we spend a lot of time on the antagonist front, sort of figuring out what makes this villain terrible. And all of our villains in our books, they're all different. Um, and so we, I think that the villain really informs what the strengths and weaknesses we want to accentuate in the hero would be. Would you agree with that, Jeff? Or you look yeah, at it a little no, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. And I, you know, from the very beginning, Brian and I agreed that we wanted to write obviously compelling heroes, but we really wanted to write compelling villains. We didn't want cartoon characters. We didn't want the bald guy stroking the cat, right? We we wanted people who would be very realistic. And in order to do that, we had to remind ourselves based on our own personal experiences in service that, you know, a, a Valerian character, for example, in, in tier one, in his point of view and world, he's the good guy. And John Dempsey is the bad guy. And I think that if you can, if you can build that into the characters, obviously you can't, you can't unbalance it so that the reader is more sympathetic with the bad guy than the good guy, but um, you need to, they need to have relationships. They need to have a sense of loss and personal motivation. And by doing that, I think that we've maybe taken our villains a step beyond what many writers do. Um, and I think by doing that, I agree with Brian, it makes the hero more compelling to have a realistic protagonist but it's the other also or antagonist it's also the reason that we arc them out a little differently we very rarely have a super villain who wraps it all up in 450 pages so we tend to arc our our bad guys out over two or three books uh in the case of the most recent uh tier one books it's four books to get full resolution on some of the bad guys from russia for example and i think that that's another technique we use that allowed us to make them bigger and richer, uh, just giving them a little more time. Obviously, we live in a day and age where the news, there is stuff happening nonstop, especially the last couple of years. And so I guess when you guys are actively writing a book and something happens in the news, uh, whether it's the pandemic or there's a cyber attack or there's a high profile kidnapping or a government overthrow in South America, do those like plot devices, do they trickle into the back of your mind like or are you trying to like i don't know i'm trying to phrase the question where i like a lot of stuff that isn't doesn't seem dated where you can pick up the book read it 10 years later and be like oh this, i don't have to know what happened this year so but when stuff like this happens in the world say when a government's overthrown where it's i think happening in three countries right now in the back of your mind are you kind of like man maybe we should talk about this a little bit or do it our way where it resonates with people right now yeah um, so to be able to write those, you know, rip from the headline books requires three things. It requires maybe a little prescience. It requires quite a bit of work to just stay informed. And Brian and I are both having been naval officers. We do stay in, informed. We subscribe to defense journals and we're just interested in it. It's not part of the right. writer world necessarily. It's just part of who we are. 
And the third one, which probably represents 80% in our case is luck. Um, so <laughs> we, have, we have been very fortunate to stay informed geopolitically. And so for example, if you look at the book Collateral, there are things written in that book that literally are happening now a year after the book comes out almost verbatim out of our book. Is that because we're geniuses? No, it's not. It's because, <laughs> it's, it's because we asked a, right, we asked a what if question in, in that book um, based on what was going on in geopolitics at the time. And our book was predictive of it because we saw things that a lot of other people see and we got very, very lucky. And so there's like three or four times now over the, I don't know how many books we've done now, 15 or 17 or something like that. Um, there's been three or four times when it's like the book comes out and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the best. I hate that that happened in the world, but how great for us. Because what, what readers maybe don't appreciate is when we brainstorm that book out and start to write it, that's like 18 months before the book is on the book yeah. And it's a, you know, even with us writing, we write a book in three or four months because we've trapped ourselves in multiple series and contracts. But um, even with books being written that quickly, there's no way we can have the book come out when that headline is really happening um, unless we're very lucky. And we have been, so. Yeah, with, with Rogue Asset, for example, you know, that book, we started working on that, like Jeff said, that, that was two years ago. And that was right after um, the, the coup in, in Sudan. And we said, you know, this is interesting. I wonder how this will play out. And we sort of saw like it, it could play out a number of different ways. But we didn't think that the, that the solution that they put in place was lasting, right? There's going to be power players that are going to be trying to manipulate to reestablish um, uh, government in their own, in their own interest. And so that became part of that book. So we, we love the geopolitics. You will find geopolitics in all of our books, some more, some a little less. But that geopolitics provides the landscape for the action and the heroes and everything that's happening. And without it, you have to wonder, like, would these people be risking their lives? Would these people be doing these things? And I think the answer is no. The geopolitics creates the landscape escape for the stakes of this story. And that's why we, we stay very well informed and, and love incorporating them in our books. And uh, to stay on Rogue Asset, one of the coolest things that I'm trying to wrap my head around, obviously the passing of W.B. Griffin, the, you were, I don't, if you could talk me through the, the breakdown of like how the recruiting process is for that, the Griffin estate to be like, hey, let's have Andrews and Wilson carry on a story or work with stuff that's already been established. Like, is that daunting for you where you have to draw the line between being your own selves writers and what W.B. Griffin uh, established himself before his passing? Well, the estate is, you know, contract with Putnam and Putnam has, you know, their editors. And so for, fortunately for us, um, Tom Colgan, who's this legendary editor, he was editor for the, for Tom Clancy. He also manages the Bourne estate, Jason, or well, the Ludlam estate rather, uh, with Jason Bourne character. So he uh, picked us. You know, he, he had read tier one. He thought that our style, while our style is very different, I'll let Jeff talk about this. I'll hand, hand the question off to him for this part of the story. But um, you know, he picked us and thought you guys would be good to carry on the mantle of the, of the presidential agent series. And so he had to pitch us to the estate. Hey, I think these guys would be good at picking up Charlie Castile. And, and so we, we put together sort of a, uh, an idea of, you know, how are we going to do this and what, where do we think the story could go? And, he, and, he, and he's that intermediary with the estate. But one thing is certain, and, and we make no claims to, to write like Webb Griffin. So I'll let Jeff tell the story about what Tom said about this. But, you know, we write like Andrews and Wilson. We don't write like Webb Griffin. So that's always the scary part is, um, you know, hey, how do we live up to this guy's legacy? Yeah, especially somebody like Griffin, right? I mean, we, we, I think the word icon is a little overused, but it clearly applies to a guy that's got 600 published works and 50 novels and all these yeah. things. And when you think of military thriller, you think Griffin, right? And so when we were first invited to do this, the first thing we felt was joy and excitement and flattery. 
And then we said yes. And then the next thing we felt was dread, and <laughs> overwhelming oppression. And for, for just that reason, like how can we measure up? How can we live up? How can we write Griffin? And um, we had a meeting with, with Tom about that. And, and we expressed our concerns. Like we've read the books, we know the characters, but we can't write like Griffin. And he said, no, don't write like Griffin. We, we're not hiring you to write like Griffin. Only Griffin can write like Griffin. And if you try to imitate his style, you will fail miserably. But no one can write like you guys either. Your job is to write the best mm -hmm. Andrews and Wilson book you can, honoring this universe and these characters and relationships that were created by this master writer. And when he told us that, that was like someone lifted like 10 backpacks off your back. Like that was the most liberating thing ever. And they were like, okay, that we can do. Uh, and that's how we set out. But I think if we had had all that pressure of trying to recreate Griffin's universe, I don't think we could have done it. I think it would have been too paralyzing. When Trevor, obviously with both you, both Navy veterans and the working with the VA and stuff as, especially this day and age, veterans are transitioning out. For those veterans that, that have an interest in writing, um, they're the ones that love the re reports and everything. And they want it. They want Maybe that's the type of healing for their PTSD or it's a form of whatever for them, therapy. Are there programs at the VA or out so where veterans can kind of reach out to, or is this, does this consist of some people reaching out to someone like you or Jack Carr or whoever it is to be like, Hey, I serve so-and-so blah, blah, blah. I love to write. Thank you for your books. How do I get writing? Like, is there programs in place for these type of uh, people? Yeah. The answer is both. Um, there are organizations, there's uh, some mentoring organizations within, um, for example, Military Writers of America, uh, Military Writers Society of America, MWSA. They have a mentorship program and a meeting where you sit with other writers. There's also several organizations, unfortunately, none of them are going to come to me right now, but there's several organizations out there that offer writing as a tool to deal with PTS, for example. Uh, whether it's poetry or fiction or nonfiction or just telling your story. And then lastly, absolutely, guys like us, we actually work at any given time, we're working with as many as a half a dozen young writers who are exploring it as either a career or catharsis, like you've suggested, uh, and the vast majority of them, in our case, are military veterans like ourselves. And so we always encourage people, if, if you have a story to tell and you're not sure how to do it, you can always reach out to us through our website, andrews-wilson.com or other writers that you feel connected to, um, whether it's Josh Hood or, or Jack, as you suggested. So I think, I think there's, there's ways to do it. It takes very a little time on the computer to find some of them, but there are formal organizations and then relationship-based stuff like us that you can do. And uh, the shirt I'm wearing today is All Secure Foundation, and it's specifically uh, to address PTSD for not just for the service member, but also the spouses. Um, because what, you know, one of the problems we've realized is that, hey, PTSD isn't just something that affects only the service member. The, the spouse, the rest of the family is going through this too at the same time. So just to separate that from the writing component, you know, if there are any listeners who are struggling or family spouses, of military members who are struggling with PTSD, All Secure Foundation is a great resource. Love it. Before I let you guys go, I am kind of curious. You mentioned like the editing process and the writing process. You got stuff in the can, you got ideas coming. Are you only, can you only focus on one at a time or are you ever in a situation where you have two to three different ideas, books at the same time? Like how do you guys kind of just filter out and just, micromanage each individual project by themselves well we love the i that's the best thing about our partnership is that between the two of us we have a lot of ideas and so they're sort of stacked up there's a queue right now so uh like for example we we took a break in the fall and wrote a short story for a week and uh that one is just it's going to be option for television so um, yeah, so just like some of the ideas might not be able to become developed into a full book, like Jeff said, we're writing four series, so we don't even have time uh, to do all the stories that we want to tell. So sometimes we're going to try to get those into, we're interested in that other part of media, film and television. 
Yeah, we, we think of ourselves not as novelists so much anymore as just storytellers and whatever mm -hmm. medium is, is accessible to that particular story or appropriate for that story, we would love to do. And um, in terms of the actual you know, distraction of it though, we have days like Monday is our day when we brainstorm, we do our business stuff. In yeah. fact, right after this, after we tape this, we're going to do our Monday call and we'll do our business stuff and we'll also do our brainstorming for the week. Um, but the schedule sort of dictates so heavily now what we do. You know, we have multiple contracts with deadlines. We have a master calendar. We know exactly what we have to work on next. So if we get distracted by this great idea, um, it's going to be a little bit too bad because starting in March, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're done with book seven in tier one. And we're going to have to start writing the third book in the Sons of Valor series because it's going to be due by the end of the summer. And so the schedule sort of dictates it now, which is good and bad. I'm not complaining. That's a great problem to have. Right. But we do feel these drawers filling up with more <laughs> and more ideas and things we want to do. And so uh, being with a company like Blackstone, uh, who's um, one of our main publishers, who are so supportive of us finding other venues by which to get our storytelling out has been a real blessing for us, for sure. And last question, when you guys are watching like a TV show that's in your kind of wheelhouse with what you guys read about, what you guys create characters in, do you ever just kind of take notes or just be like, that's not really, or you just enjoy it for what it is? Because sometimes, like I said before, <laughs> I'll watch stuff that's Secret Service related, you all, all the way to the West Wing, you'd be like, that hallway's not that long or just, <laughs> stuff like that. Are you guys distracted? <laughs> you actually just enjoy movies and other forms of movies without being like, oh. It's both. I mean, I think I've got an ability to just enjoy the story and the characters for what they are. But when they get, like you're saying, when they get things just, just terribly wrong, it ruins it for me. And I know that's annoying for my wife. I'm like, oh, come on, that would never like. The, and for me, it's not like, oh, they wouldn't use that gun or the hallway's not quite that long. It's more like uh, this is an example we use all the time. They're in the the Humvee tearing off to stop the terrorist attack. And as they go, they turn to each other and they go, how are things going with Beth? Like, no, never. In a billion years is that the time when you have that time? Not saying they don't have those conversations, but they do it over a beer. They don't do it while they're checking their weapons and kidding up. So, um, yeah, some of those things annoy you. And then you would get to annoy your wife. So <laughs> My wife, my, we were watching this. <laughs> The show. And she started calling me the safety man because we'd be watching the show. I'd be like, he'd never do that without a harness. Why is he not clipped in? What, where is it? Where? <laughs> he, start, he started pointing out all the flaws of these idiots that are, that are orchestrating their own doom. You know, we would, no pro would act like a lot of these guys do on the show. But I will say that Jeff and I have more empathy for these writers now. Because what you're trying to do, you are constrained. And here, here's sort of the two constraints that so we'll wrap this up. But one is OPSEC. You don't want to really like give away the true tactics and methods and put your brothers and sisters who are still at the pointy tip of the spear at risk. So that's important to us. And the other is just like melodrama. You know, there's this dramatic element that if you don't have that in the story, the people watching me like, click, this is boring. Click, this is stupid. You know, so you have to work in the OPSEC and the drama and that's why a lot of these contrived or ridiculous situations sort of occur. So we, we have some empathy for these TV writers now. We know what they're up against. Which is, again, titled together uh, as we wrap this up, your books are, they got the action, but they also have the human aspect that's easily relatable uh, to everyone out there that wants to read these books. So obviously you guys have a website, you have social media, but if people, um, Barnes & Noble has all the books, Dark Intercept, all the series, uh, if people want to reach out to you or just see what you got up to, do you recommend the website or social media? Oh, the website for sure. I mean, people, we, we love interacting on social media. Obviously, that's always just fun. But um, if you really want to get in touch with us or if you want to follow what's going on, you go to andrews-wilson.com. That's our website. We have a newsletter that you can mm -hmm. sign up for. We do not spam your inbox. We are very judicious with what we send out. It's only true, interesting announcements about what's going on. And also newsletter subscribers get early access to some stuff. They get access to some short fiction that we do that isn't publicly available, those sorts of things. So there, there's some advantages. Um, but there's also ways on the website 
that you can communicate with us. There's email addresses that you'll find there to send us an email. And we actually have a fan page now. I got to credit Brian. Brian worked so hard on, on taking our website to the next level. There's a, a fan page where you can send pictures of you with the books or in settings that are interesting. And we, uh, we vet them, of course, but then we post them on the website so that fans can interact with one another. So the website's definitely the way to go. Love it. Well, uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your time today. And uh, I have some more books to read and stuff. So, uh, <laughs> but anyways, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your service and uh, never stop writing. Thanks, John. It was really Thanks. good talking to you, man. Yeah, yeah, great interview. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spear Talk. You might not know this, but before I record an episode, I like to break a sweat. And I do that using the chop fit. Over the course of the past year, the chop fit has allowed me to lose weight, tone up my body, and feel even more amazing about myself. A feeling that you should all feel about yourself as well. If you use this code, SPEARCHOP10, you get $10 off your order. Once again, use code SPEARCHOP10 for $10 off your chop fit order. It'll change your life. Thank you.